Okay, hello and welcome to another tutorial video. As you can see, we're going to be going back to project finance in this one and talking about debt sculpting versus debt sizing. So for all the files and resources, you'll wanna go to this URL on screen, go to our project finance page and then debt sculpting versus debt sizing. I'll also link to this below the video and pin it as the first comment. This is another summary or excerpt from our full project finance and infrastructure modeling course. So there's a lot of confusion over what sculpting and sizing debt in project finance actually mean. And when I was researching this topic, I found that a lot of people talk about this, but they don't really explain why the process is tricky if you do it correctly, and also some simple ways you can get around the common issues and resolve it in models. So we're gonna start with a quick two or three minute version of what debt sculpting and sizing mean. Then we'll go through a very simple debt sculpting example. We'll look at debt sizing based on the debt service coverage ratio. Then we'll look at debt sizing based on the loan life coverage ratio. And then we'll look at some simple VBA code you can use to automate debt sizing and avoid circular references that usually pop up if you do it correctly in models. So let's start with the short version. Debt sculpting means that you change the required debt principal repayments in each period based on the available cash flow, the interest expense, and the targeted coverage ratio. It could be the debt service coverage ratio or the loan life coverage ratio, or even another variant of those, but those are the basic parameters. Debt sizing means that you set the initial debt balance in the model such that it reaches zero on a specific date based on the sculpted repayments and the other terms of the debt, such as the interest expense. The reason you do this is because in project finance, future cash flows tend to be quite predictable since they're often governed by contracts that lock in prices and volumes and price escalations over time, such as power purchase agreements or PPAs in the power and utility sector. Lenders like this concept of linking the debt service, so the interest expense plus principal repayments to cash flows, it reduces their risk because it better matches the repayments to the actual cash flows that are available from the asset. Meanwhile, the equity investors like debt sizing and sculpting because effectively it lets them use more debt since they get credit for the future cash flow growth that is already usually locked in or very predictable if it is linked to something like economic growth or population growth or something like that for a transportation asset or a water utility, for example. Now, debt sculpting is pretty simple to set up. You can use a series of min-max formulas in Excel to do it, and we'll look at an example coming up soon. Debt sizing gets much harder because there's an inherent circular relationship between the future cash flows and the initial debt balance, because the future cash flows depend on the interest paid on the debt and the tax deduction that comes from that, but that interest expense and the tax deduction also depend on the initial debt balance, and that's what creates a lot of issues. Luckily, you can solve it pretty easily, whether you want to use goal seek, VBA, or some simplifications. Let's look at a very simple debt sculpting example. Here are the basic parameters. So if we say that the cash flow in a model in year one is 150 and the targeted debt service coverage ratio is 1.5x, let's go into Excel and see what this looks like. So I have up here an example. We have an $800 starting debt balance. This is really 800 million, 10% interest rate, a debt service coverage ratio of 1.5x. If we have 150 in cash flow, then the max debt service allowed is this 150 divided by the debt service coverage ratio of 1.5x. If we calculate the interest expense, let's just do that right now by linking in the beginning debt balance here. The interest expense in this first period is 80 because it's 10% times the starting debt balance of 800. So the maximum debt amortization here equals the max between zero and this debt service minus the interest expense. This max zero just handles the case where if the interest expense exceeds this debt service somehow, then we don't have any amortization at all. And then the sculpted amortization here is simply the negative minimum between the beginning debt balance and this max debt amortization allowed. This just prevents us from over amortizing and getting to a negative balance here. So if we have some number left that's very small, we don't wanna amortize all 20 if only 10 of debt is left and that's what this function handles. And then we can sum up everything like that. And this is a very, very simple example of how you sculpt debt in project finance. And you can see that by the time we get to year 10, this balance reaches zero. And we mostly maintain a 1.5x debt service coverage ratio for this whole time. So that is debt sculpting. I have a quick summary here in PowerPoint if you wanna see all the numbers laid out. Let's go into debt sizing. First, looking at an example based on the debt service coverage ratio. 
So the cash flow available for debt service in project finance models is usually defined as EBITDA minus the maintenance capex plus or minus the change of working capital because it could be either positive or negative depending on the period and the cash flows minus cash taxes. The debt service coverage ratio is the cash flow available for debt service in one specific year divided by the debt service in that specific year. And you just saw an example of that when I went through the debt sculpting example. So what you want to do here is project the cash flow available for debt service for the asset in each year. Then you calculate the interest expense, the max debt service, and the max debt amortization each year based on the debt terms. So we could use the 10% interest rate and the 1.5x debt service coverage ratio I just showed you. Then once you do this, you want to set the initial debt to some higher number and use Goal Seek to find the initial balance that produces a $0 balance in year 10, assuming it's debt with a 10-year maturity or a 10-year tenor. This is fairly simple and easy to set up, but it is not that flexible. Let's go in and look at how you do this. Okay, so I have up here on screen the very simple model that we were just working on before. And as I just showed you, the debt reaches a $0 balance in year 10. However, we have an issue here, which is that the debt service coverage ratio is 1.52x in year 10, when it really should be 1.5x. This tells us that the debt is not sized appropriately. So what we can do here is set the initial debt balance to some higher number that would result in a definite non-zero balance in year 10. Let's go over and take a look at this and verify. So we end up with 127 million of debt, which is definitely too high. So we can set up a goal seek to do this. Let's go over here to the end, to the ending debt balance in year 10, Alt A W G in the PC version of Excel. We wanna set cell O24 to zero by changing the initial debt balance cell in E10 right here. We just ran goal seek, we get to a $0 balance, and you can see that the initial debt balance just needs to be slightly higher, 800.9 million in the beginning. And when we do that, we get the required debt service coverage ratio of 1.5X in every single year. So that is a very simple example of sizing based on the debt service coverage ratio and goal seek. Let's look at an example of sizing based on another ratio called the loan life coverage ratio. So this is the present value version of the debt service coverage ratio. So the initial loan life coverage ratio in a model when the debt is first issued equals the present value of all the cash flow available for debt service and the debt tenor divided by that initial debt number. And we can rearrange the terms here. So we can say that the LLCR times that debt balance equals the present value of all cash flow available for debt service. This is just basic algebra multiplying by the debt balance on both sides. And then we can use algebra again and divide by the LLCR to move it to the other side of the equation and the debt balance equals the present value of all cash flow available for debt service divided by the LLCR. Let's go into Excel and see how this one works. Now, in this example, we've defined the loan life coverage ratio of 1.5x, which is actually equivalent to the debt service coverage ratio, because if you size and sculpt the debt based on one, it should be equivalent to sizing and sculpting the debt based on the other. So if you look at these formulas here, the max debt service allowed equals the cash flow available for debt service divided by the loan life coverage ratio right up here. We've still guessed 800 million for the initial debt balance, but let's start by taking the present value of the cash flow available for debt service over this 10 year debt tenor. I'll just use a simple NPV function. We'll use the 10% interest rate on the debt and we will go through year 10 here and I'll be very careful to stop right before year 11. So it's about 1.2 billion. For the initial debt balance, we take this and divide by the LLCR and we get to that same 800.9 million, but we did it in a very different way. This is a bit better because now we're using a formula to do it. So if something ever changes in the model, like the interest rate or the coverage ratio, then this will update automatically. So this is a slight improvement, but obviously it's still not very flexible. We're still linking to this hard-coded range of cells. So there are still some issues with this approach. And I just summarized them up here. The DSCR and LLCR equivalency is very important and useful as well. There are some exceptions to this rule when you get into more advanced debt features and models, but it works pretty well for these types of simple models. So the last topic I wanna to cover here is what makes debt sizing more difficult? Because so far, it might seem pretty easy based on these examples. And I wanna explain why it gets more complex in real life. The problem here is that the cash flow available for debt service subtracts the cash taxes, but the cash taxes change based on the interest expense because the interest expense is tax deductible at the corporate level. And most of these assets are owned by corporations or some type of entity that owes corporate taxes. 
So I have this guest appearance by Thanos here who explains the problem, which is that the initial debt balance determines the future interest expense. That interest expense affects the taxes. The taxes affect the cash flow available for debt service, but the future cash flow available for debt service also affects the initial debt balance. So you get a giant circular loop here, and it's all because of the way interest and taxes work in the model. To illustrate this problem, I'll actually just show you in Excel what happens here. So let's say that we link directly to the interest expense. This is a variant of the model that I just had on screen, except now we're calculating cash flow available for debt service the real way based on revenue minus expenses plus or minus various cash flow line items. So if we link to the interest expense directly, let's just do this and I'll show you the issue that comes up. And now if we base the cash taxes on this pre-tax income times the tax rate, you can see that at the very bottom of Excel right here, we get this label about calculate. And what that means is that we have a circular reference. If you go to options, alt T O or command comma on the Mac, and then you go to formulas and you disable iterative calculations, it shows you the exact problem. We have a circular reference between the present value of the cash flow available for debt service and the interest expense and the cash taxes and the beginning and ending debt balances here. So it is not that easy to resolve. Now, some people would say that you could just leave this in and enable circular references. And some people might do that, but many groups and firms would not accept models with circular references. You could also use the pre-tax versions or you could just use goal seek to do this instead of setting up the NPV formula like we had right here. So there are some other solutions, but the real way to fix this in most cases is to use VBA to create what's known as a copy paste macro that tricks Excel into using a hard coded version of the cash flow available for debt service rather than the calculated version. So to do this, we'll create a separate macros tab with named cell ranges and a comparison cell. We'll link in the calculated cash flow available for debt service. We'll do a copy and paste. Then we'll link to this pasted version on the main model tab. We'll then update all the references to use the pasted version and also update the NPV formula. And then we'll record and edit a VBA macro to do what we just did and to replace the code with a simple do until loop. Once we have the setup, we'll be able to press a simple keyboard shortcut to update the entire model when something changes and resize the debt automatically. So I have up here the same file that we we're using. We still have a circular reference, which you can tell by the calculate label at the very bottom. We have a separate macros tab set up. And the first thing that you wanna do is go over here and make sure that the ranges that you're using here actually have the correct numbers and also the correct names. So I'm gonna start by naming the cells over here I'll go to control F3 and I'll call this CFADS links. This just makes it easier to refer to these cells within VBA later on. And then I'll go to the one right below it. And this one I'll call CFADS paste. And so we have that. And then for the check comparison cell here, I will call this one check underscore CFADS. And to set this up, we can start by linking to the calculated version of the cash flow available for debt service. I'll copy the formula over, and then I'll do a copy and paste as values, Alt ESV in Excel, in the PC version anyway. And then we can sum up all of this. So let's sum up both of these. And then for the check slash comparison, we'll just use a round function and subtract. We can round it to zero digits because we don't need a super high amount of precision here. So we have that. Now we can go back here and we can link to this pasted version that I just created. And we have to look at the calculated version and see where it's referenced in the model and replace these references as appropriate. So I'm gonna replace this reference here with the pasted version instead for the max debt service allowed. I'm also gonna replace it in this formula here and link to row 33 instead of row 31. So we have that. I will not change the DSCR calculation here at the bottom because in this case, we actually want this as a check. So if I go in and I change the interest rate now to 8%, let's say. We have an issue because we fall below the minimum debt service coverage ratio of 1.5x. However, if I go over here and I copy paste these values, and then I do another copy paste because we don't have an exact match yet. Now we get an exact match. And if you go over here, the debt service coverage ratio is now correct at 1.5x. So this is nice, but we'd like to automate this process. And so what we can do is go over to the macros tab and go to the macro recorder, alt LR in the PC version. I can call this one size debt, control shift S. And then let's just do a simple copy and paste. So select this whole range and then 
paste his values right here, and let's just stop recording right there. So now let's go into the VBA editor, Alt-LV in the PC version, go to modules, module one. We can delete all this code because it's not really doing anything useful and it didn't really record it correctly. And I'm just going to insert a do loop right here. And I'm gonna say that we want to loop this until the check underscore CFADS cell dot value equals zero. And then I'll say range CFADS paste. This is how we refer to named ranges in VBA dot value equals range CFADS links dot value. All this is doing is literally copying and pasting as values from one range into the other range, what we just did manually in Excel. And it keeps doing this until we get an exact match or at least something close to an exact match here. So let's try this out now. Let's go back and this should be assigned to control shift S. Let's try changing the interest rate to 10% now. Our DSCRs do not match because our debt balance is off. If I press control shift S, we get an error and it's actually good to point out. So what happened here is that if you look at the named ranges here, I actually misspelled this one. I said CFDAS instead of CFADS. And so VBA did not handle this correctly, but it's pretty easy to find this if you go and look at the named ranges and cells. So let me just fix that. So it's not letting me fix that. I need to delete this formula first. Let's do that. And let's go in and say CFADS paste instead. And let's see if this works correctly now. So let's try this again, control shift S and the debt has been resized and we get to the correct debt service coverage ratio now. And you can keep trying this. You can try changing the coverage ratio or the interest rate or both control shift S and everything resizes and you hit that minimum debt service coverage ratio here. So this is the smarter way to do it with a bit of VBA code. It's really just three lines of code. It's not that complicated, but it makes your life a lot easier. And of course you can go well beyond this. This just really scratches the surface of debt sizing and sculpting, but it should give you a good introduction to the topic and why it can get tricky. When you get into quarterly models or optional debt repayments or multiple tranches of debt, this can get even more complex, but these are the fundamentals that you need to know for project finance. To summarize, we started out with why project finance uses debt sculpting and sizing in the first place. It helps lenders better manage their risks because it matches the debt repayments to the asset's ability to pay for those repayments based on its cash flows. Also for the equity investors, effectively it lets them use more debt, which generally boosts returns if the asset performs well. It works because cash flows in many project finance deals and for many infrastructure assets are predictable or relatively predictable. We went through a simple debt sculpting example and how you can use the min max formulas to back into the proper debt principal repayment. Then we looked at a simple example of debt sizing based on the debt service coverage ratio and how you can use goal seek to figure out the initial balance that gets you to a zero balance by the end. Then we looked at how to do it using the loan life coverage ratio with the NPV formula that was more flexible, but it doesn't solve the issue of the circular references that come up if you include the taxes and the interest expense tax deduction. And to solve that, we normally use VBA, although you can use approaches with goal seek or other methods as well, if you can find a way to automate them a little bit more. So that's about it for this tutorial about debt sizing and debt sculpting and project finance. Hopefully now you have a better idea of what these are all about and you have a few simple examples in Excel you can use as well.